Hi, folks. Uh, this is a it's a pleasure to be here. This even though I've been working on this talk for the last month or so, um, probably a talk that's been like 16 years in the making. Uh, and I'm going to tell you that story tonight. Uh, but first, um, if you are currently employed by or have previously been employed by the city of Toronto, would you raise your hand? All right, let's applaud for these people. Uh, what you're going to find out is that this, this talk is kind of a prayer for open data and also a bit of a love song for civil servants who are some of my favorite humans. I too like property taxes and they pay their salaries. So uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of them. Also in my many, many years ago, a previous job, I was the guy who raised your property taxes. So you're welcome, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, what's that? Should I turn on my video? I can absolutely do that so the folks online can look up my notes. Okay. I've done all the right things. I didn't even unmute myself and ruin the AV. Okay, so who's this guy? Um, oh, that really is up my nose, that's rough. Um, okay, um, so I spent about seven years working at the city of Toronto. I was part of a wave of progressives who came in in 2003 when David Miller was elected mayor. I worked for a few different councillors, Jabroni, Pantaloni, Shelley Carroll, who's currently the budget chief, and I worked with her when she was budget chief. Uh, and eventually um, helped run uh, the budget for the mayor uh, when I was in his office uh, during the second term. One of the things I did at the city was help start the Open Data Project at the city of Toronto. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that story, how that sets us up for today. Um, I've also spent most of the last sort of 13 years working in public interest technology organizations. I was at Mozilla, the folks who made Firefox. I ran Creative Commons uh, for five years as its CEO. Uh, they make the CC licenses, which used to share all kinds of content, photos and Flickr, open data, et cetera. Um, and then I was at uh, Wikipedia as chief of staff uh, before I was uh, at the Aspen Institute. Um, today, uh, I'm a senior technology fellow at the Aspen Institute, which is a DC think tank that works on policy around technology and the internet. I work on things like disinformation, open source, ethical tech, um, open data, but I'm also uh, the CEO of a new nonprofit that we started during the summer called Conscience, which uses AI tools and open science to try to drive drug discovery in areas of market failure, places where traditional pharma has abandoned its research or is not pursuing drugs that people still need. Um, and so I work kind of in and around this AI space quite a bit. Um, and so I was pretty excited what, um, by some of the things that have developed, starting with the release of ChatGPT uh, with a chatbot in uh, November of 2000. Uh, and the last year before that has been, as you all know, because you've been on this ride with me, kind of wild. Uh, everything's coming up AI, and it has sort of changed the conversation. And so I want to talk a little bit about what that, what that has unlocked for those of us that have been wishing open data would realize its great potential for so long. So I think it is a real game changer for some things that I think a lot of us wished for when we started. So I want to tell you a little bit about that story. I was a very small piece of that story. And I'll caveat that by saying that my version of the story might leave folks out because I know lots of people worked on this all at the same time. Um, and, and I was only one piece of that. And like lots of great ideas, many people move that idea from different perspectives at different points. Uh, and so no one person owns that idea. But I want to tell you the version that I experienced and was a little bit part of um, and tell you how it sets up the Parks mm -hmm. Forestry and Rec bot. Mm -hmm. I am going to tell you how I built it. Um, but it actually wasn't that hard, as anybody who's played with it knows, but I'll talk to you a little bit about it uh, and maybe make a little wish at the end for what I hope will happen next. Uh, so this is the timeline. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that story. So open data is actually how I got my start in public interest technology, um, and it's how I got my first job in tech sort of by accident. Um, so in 2003, as I mentioned, I, I came to City Hall with a bunch of other folks who were uh, progressives uh, and were working, to, hoping to make the city better under David Miller. Um, I worked on all kinds of policy, transit policy, environmental policy, the city worked on the city's tree bylaw, did a lot of solid waste policy, uh, and I, as I said, eventually worked on the budget. But I also ended up working on tech stuff. I was sort of the guy who knew about tech in the mayor's office, um, which sometimes meant I'd fix his Blackberry when he dropped it in a puddle. Um, and it sometimes meant that I got to work on things like the launch of 311 or open, the Open Data Project. Um, and so somewhere in the midst of all this, a lot of us were starting to get excited about what was possible around open data. Cities like 
uh, DC with Vivek Kundra and San Francisco and New York and a few other cities have really kind of leapt out ahead. DC really was the one well up front, but a bunch of us thought Toronto could do that too, but it needed a push. Uh, and there was lots of push in the community and there was appetite inside the city, both in the IT department, the clerk's office, and on the political front. So we kind of organized to try and move that ball. And IT organized this Web 2.0 Summit to start to have a conversation. This is how long ago we called it Web 2.0, um, was to, to try and see what was possible. And so I worked with, one of the things that I knew is that open data wouldn't be successful if we didn't have a community behind it. Uh, if you didn't have uh, people working with it, you couldn't just put, throw the stuff out on the stoop and hope that things would happen. Although a lot of that is what ended up happening. Um, so I went out to the folks at Mozilla. They're the folks who make Firefox. Uh, and at the time they were at sort of the height of their success, almost half a billion users, back when half a billion users was an epic number of users uh, to have. And I reached out to them uh, to get them to help make a presentation. The presentation that they gave was going to be called a city that thinks like the web. And my job was to help with that presentation and then to make sure that the mayor sat in the front row when the presentation happened, which I did. Um, and so he sat in the front row. This is from the blog post from uh, my colleague at Mozilla who talked about uh, doing uh, about his talk in a sort of post talk blog post. And he, he mentions that during the entire talk, the mayor was frantically taking notes uh, and was typing and turned out later he was typing to members of his staff. I was the person that he was typing to. I was standing at the back of the room and what he was saying was, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm going to go back up to the podium and announce it immediately. Because that's what David did, uh, Mayor Miller did. He would get excited about something and then he would put the full force and weight of the mayor's office behind it to try and give cover to uh, people to pursue those good ideas, but also to be wind in the sails of bureaucrats who needed permission to go do good work and needed political coverage. Here. And that wasn't always there. I really think that was his like greatest gift uh, to the city and to the public service. Anyone who had seen um, the previous mayor speak knew that he had a sort of unabiding love for the public service and really respected and appreciated that. Um, and knew that if he could convince other people to do the same, that we would have a better city as a result. And maybe you'd like paying the property taxes too. Um, so a couple of weeks after the Web 2.0 Summit, uh, so I talked him down. He didn't announce it on the spot. We thought maybe we should talk to staff first and do a little bit of background work. And we wanted to do an announcement, but he was sold. So that gave us the kind of momentum that we needed, all the folks who had been working on this to kind of go and organize. Um, and so a couple of weeks after the Web 2.0 Summit, I found myself in meetings with IT and clerk staff and others, figuring out what could be done. And there were other people all over the city who were excited by this and working on it as well. These were the early days of Twitter, um, back when it was good and not a raging cesspool. Um, and so we were trying to model what government could do and how transparent it could be. Back then, um, we helped Mayor Miller get on Twitter, and he was one of the only politicians in the country who was actually writing his own tweets at the time, was responding to people regularly, um, and kind of set a model for how to be an agent. So I tweeted this back then. This was only a few weeks after the Web Summit. And basically just told everybody that we were going to do the thing, um, and, and we were all working. So it was sort of open. But six months after that, we went to a conference in Toronto, the Mesh Conference. How many of you ever went to Mesh Conference? A few of you, okay. It was a big deal back then. It was like the uh, conference for technology and people were going to. Um, it was filled with tech leaders and creators and people working on startups. Um, and we uh, arranged for the mayor to give a keynote and then be interviewed by Jesse Brown, that's Jesse Photo. Um, and we announced that we were going to build toronto.ca slash open and that we were going to open up all this data. Um, I found this one. Um, that's me on the right. I was such a baby uh, back then. Um, that was uh, right after the talk, uh, speaking with uh, the event. Back then, Suzanne Long and I ran a workshop as part of the MeSH conference, and we invited folks to tell us what data they want. Like, if we're going to open up all the data, what are you excited about? What do you wish for? What do you want to work on? And what kinds of things might you build? Um, and I pulled these two photos from the sheets that we took, and that's my horrible handwriting. I apologize, but two sheet, things on these sheets that stand out to me. People wanted parks and rec program availability, hockey rink data, um, the ability to find a community program by GOS or map location or location ID, um, and to find the things that are closest and most available to me. People were wishing for these things 16 years ago and wanted the ability to find that really easily. Um, and so that always stuck with me. Um, the thing I really wanted, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, is the ability to know where the snowplow is or has been or where it's going to be. And there's a huge story behind that, which I, I will tell you briefly as part of this. But um, one of the things we learned was that open data isn't easy. 
uh, especially if you didn't generate the data in the first place. Um, but less than a year after we launched the Web 2.0 Summit and had this conversation, talked about a city that looks like the web, less than a year later, Toronto.ca slash open launched with data sets behind it. Less than a year for a civic government is pretty impressive. Um, and everyone was motivated to do that. And it was really important uh, to the mayor that we actually move quickly and show people that we weren't joking and that we were gonna do this. So we literally went door to door to uh, departments and asked them for data that we could share. We had lots of good mapping data. Other departments had data they could give up. Others didn't want to share their data. The TTC did not want to share their data. Um, and they were worried that people would know where the buses were and then they would, I don't know, get on them and pay fares. I don't know what it was, but they didn't want that to happen. Um, and so, um, but we had a mandate and that helped us make it a priority. We were able to strong arm folks to share their data, get some good stuff out the door. And then once we got it out the door, we had momentum. So this is the site. Thank you to the Internet Archive and the Wayback Machine. Uh, this is what the site looked like on November 2nd, uh, 2009, the day uh, after it launched, uh, which was the day that the archive uh, scanned it. Um, I wasn't able to pull a scan of the data sets. So I couldn't pull the number of data sets that there were at the start. There weren't a lot, but there were dozens. Uh, it wasn't the hundreds that we have now. Um, and a lot of people, like I said, made this possible. And I wasn't the only person who had the idea. Um, but certainly I got to be part of it. There are folks like Mark Kuznicki, Suzanne Long, who I mentioned, Megan Warby, and people in staff like Trish Garner, Darren Chartier, Samir Vasta, who went on to the Ontario government as well. John Elvich, who's now the city clerk, who's a huge champion internally uh, and a big friend of the project, and the CIO at the time, Dave Wallace. Um, there were many, many other folks. Those are the folks I got to work with, and all those folks worked really hard to help make this happen. There are many, many other folks who helped bring this to life. This is the site today. Uh, so 465 data sets, many of them updated in real time. There's an API that you can access for many of those data sets. So you can actually write apps to talk to it and update themselves. Um, we've, we've always wanted that and many of those things came to fruition. All of this, um, I think, uh, with not a lot of resources, if I'm honest. I mean, it was people kind of scraped together both their passion and their time and found a way to do it. The city did dedicate some resources to it. It has contract money. It brought some people in. Some of the folks I mentioned were able to dedicate real time to it. But and and but it wasn't until almost a decade later that the city wrote the open or passed the open data master plan that they even just started to say like let's put real money behind this. And, and I actually I would defer to some of my friends in the public service here as to whether that real money has come. And they're probably all too decent to say whether it hasn't. So maybe there isn't a good answer there. Um, but certainly uh, there could be more. The thing that I think is important about this before I get to the app is that we all kind of had a dream that um, open data uh, was a little bit sort of like garbage on the back stoop, that if we just put it out front, civic tech developers would go through it and make apps out of it. And we kind of thought that would happen. And we knew there was a little bit of work that had to be done there, but I think we were, if I'm honest, a little bit optimistic about how hard that was going to be. And some of that we also learned on the back end when we started talking uh, to the to the departments about the kind of data that we wish we had versus the kind of data they actually had and the kind of data that they were funded to produce. Because uh, if you're not in the business of producing machine readable, re frequently updated, refreshed data, then you have to get into that business. It doesn't happen by itself. Uh, and sometimes if that data isn't generated in the right way to begin with, uh, it can be very difficult to make it into that data that you wish it was. Although AI may change that game a little bit. I'm going to come back to that and tell you a couple of those stories at the end. So enter ChatGPT. Uh, for those of you, I assume everybody. So ChatGPT is a large language model. It allows, it, it is really good at imitating uh, and predicting text. And so it can impersonate the text uh, production of a human being. And you can ask it questions and it writes back text that is quite believable uh, and often useful. On its own, ChatGPT as a large language model is actually not very useful if you care about things like facts. Um, if, you, if it matters to you that the thing that it tells you is true or even not fantastical, it is, ChatGPT by itself is not that. Um, it's not trained up to the current date, and so it doesn't know what happened yesterday. And in some cases, depending on the model, doesn't know what happened three years ago. Um, and so it's not a search engine. Um, and it is not useful for telling you the answers to questions that you might deeply care about, um, especially if those questions might cause you to say, send your children to a community center 
uh, or make choices about your property taxes. Um, and so on its own, it was never the solution, but it was revolutionary when it was released uh, in November, uh, a little over a year ago, November, um, because it made it accessible to every person. Um, and that's why I got 100 million users inside of like a week uh, is because, and became the fastest growing app in history is because it put these tools in the hands of everyday people. It's also what made it one of the most dangerous tools on the street because it put those tools in the hands of everyday people. Um, about a month and a half ago, they released an updated set of features. And one of those features is the game changer that made this possible, is the ability to train uh, your own sort of private GPT. So basically, you start with a base of the generic LLM, which is really good at predicting text, and then you can add to it your own data, documents, data sets, articles, whatever. You can even have it index a particular website if you want to. Um, and then you can train it, which really just means type to it and have it talk back to you in a user interface that's quite easy to use. And then you can constrain it. Uh, and you can tell it things like, if the answer to my question isn't in the file I gave you, say I don't know, which regular ChatGPT doesn't do. It just makes stuff up. Um, but ChatGPT then trained and constrained by other data models can give you reliable answers or not give you answers at all if it doesn't know, which when I'm thinking about giving people advice about, let's say, where to send, to send my kid to a community center, I want it to say I don't know if it doesn't know. Um, and so that became really interesting. So I'm, I was at this conference in Chicago, the Pritzker Forum on Global Cities. The topic was AI. They invited a whole bunch of people around, and I was there to talk about uh, cities and trust uh, because of the work that I'd done with the Aspen Institute on disinformation. Uh, and I ended up in a conversation with some folks who were there from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities who were saying, well, we don't really know what AI can do and whether there's a relevant piece here. And I got a little bit excited and worked up and was like, are you kidding? You can't figure out what to do with this? This is your moment. There are like stockpiles and stockpiles of open data, like the scene at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, waiting for somebody to do something with them. And suddenly you have a thing that you can train it on and you can use it to put stuff into the hands of regular everyday citizens who otherwise are never going to your open data store. Um, I think the power of that is remarkable. Also, in the greatest traditions of open source, never write new code, there's a real opportunity to write things for municipalities that one municipality could create and every municipality could use because everyone has a library, everyone has garbage collection. And so even though the streets are different, a lot of the needs are common. Um, and if there's one thing that I've lamented is that there isn't more collaboration in the civic space when so many cities have the same features and just have, and, and there isn't enough of that sharing of code and the thing we build that somebody else gets. Into. Um, Fun fact, at that same event, John Lawrence, who lots of you know as a civic writer, won the book award, which is totally weird that I go all the way to Chicago and run into John Lawrence, but I haven't seen forever, um, won, won it for a book on civic tech, uh, which is super interesting. So in this conversation with FCM, I was like, look, I could write a Parks and Rec chatbot in an hour. And they're like, really? And I was like, sure. And so I did. Um, and the reason I said right is because all I had to do was go back to my hotel room that night, knowing that there were a bunch of open data sets that that civic employees had been producing for years and updating and making available, I knew I could pull those down. I knew that they were under an open license that I could use. And I knew I could upload them to the tool and build something. So I spent about, it was actually about 90 minutes uh, in order to build chatbot. Uh, so let me talk to you a little bit about how I did it. It's not that hard and it's a thing you all could do. And I'm confident that somebody who works in parks, forestry and recreation and knows the ins and outs would do a better job than I could do. But I did it as a demo to just show that it's possible and hopefully to get people excited about other ideas they might have on their own. And also to be able to come back the next morning and send it to the folks at FCM, which I did. And that was sort of part of the point. Um, so the first step was to start with data. These are the data sets that I use. Um, I did, some of them are in here twice because one of the weaknesses of ChatGPT's GPT generator is that it won't auto update files and it won't talk to an API. And so I had to go back in when the files were refreshed because the fine folks at Parks, Forestry, and Recreation update those, that data regularly. So I went back in and grabbed the latest data to update it once the latest update came. But it has to be done manually. So that's why you see some files in there twice. And then I had to tell GPT to default to the latest data and not use old data when it answers questions. Um, I suspect that that's going to get ugly and messy over time with my demo. And I hope over time they ship something with an API access that would be much cleaner and easier to use. Um, 
So I uploaded all that stuff and then I just started asking it questions. And so I could say like, tell me where I can go skating to or I'm interested in uh, a program uh, for uh, Pilates or whatever. And I started asking a question and seeing it, what it gave me. So I asked it a skating question and it said, I don't know anything about skating in Toronto. Why don't you check their website? And I was like, how do you not know about skating in Toronto? Well, it turns out I hadn't looked up the, I, the skating facilities data is in a different file and the program information isn't in that, isn't in the program listing. So I went and found that data, uploaded it, and then asked it the same question and answered it for me. Um, then I realized that it wasn't, it kept giving me answers in the East End. I live in the East End, that's great. But I was like, why is it giving me answers in the East End? Um, and so I asked it, I changed some of the prompts and I asked it to ask users some questions before it gave them location-based answers. And so now uh, it asks you, where are you located or where would you like to take your class or in, take your program so that it can give you locations that are close to where you ask for. So if you say, I'm interested in things in Scarborough, it will give you results that are more or less near Scarborough as a default. Um, also, because so many of the programs are age related, uh, I asked it to always ask if you're looking for things at the first specific age group. So then I was able to go back in and ask it the question that was like the holy grail of questions back in 2007 when we were asking about open data. I have two kids, one is five and one is 12. I wanna put them in swimming on Saturday morning and I, want to, I want them to take a class at the same time. Where can I go? Answered it flawlessly every time, every time, every time. Because it's just data, of course it answered it flawlessly. But um, that was like the, the killer for me. It was like, oh, this is actually a really eminently useful thing because it solves a problem that parents have every day that nobody has time to solve that is e most easily answered by talking to a human, but now can be answered at any time of day by a chatbot fairly reliably. Um, my last step was to add a couple of disclaimers, so I made sure that uh, the license was correctly referenced in order to comply with the open uh, open government license, uh, and also a disclaimer that says, all things being equal, I would encourage you still to check that these that these programs are still running or that you know the community center is actually open that day, et cetera. But this is a great starting point. You can get people to a pretty good place. Um, there, there are some issues, uh, some things that I wish that it did. So I've already mentioned there's no API access, which really is gonna hamper the ability of this to stay useful and stay current. And I would never push this into production without solving a problem like that. Um, I think as a demo, it's great for that. Um, also, for those of you who've tried to use it, the current model requires paid access. Uh, so you have to be a paid user of OpenAI's ChatGPT. The store was supposed to open yesterday. Um, I didn't see a release that says it came out. I see some shaking heads, so I think they missed their launch date, fine. I think what happens when the store comes out is they appify the bots. And so you will basically have the opportunity that for I don't know how much money, let's take the Apple store version and say 99 cents, you could buy access to a chatbot and have, or maybe it's gonna be paper to use. I don't know what they're gonna do, but I imagine that the store breaks down the paywall. And so we get to a model pretty quickly where uh, users can have access to a particular chatbot they like without having to have a subscription to all of OpenAI's tools for 20 bucks a month if you don't want that. Um, and then the last thing that I think is, is pretty important is that in terms of accessibility, it only works in English, or at least I've only tested it in English, and I don't think it's as reliable as I would like it to be in the 50 other languages that the City of Toronto puts so much effort into caring about. Um, and uh, it's a text-based medium, so if text isn't your jam, whether it's because of mobility or visual acuity or whatever, this isn't gonna work right for you. Um, the app lets you talk to it if you have it on the app, um, you can actually use text-to-speech on the app, and it works pretty well. Uh, during the holidays, I built a bartender bot uh, that is trained on all my favorite cocktails. It works really well. Um, and I can just talk to it, so I can just press it, and it'll talk to me, and it'll give me cocktail recipes. So um, that's pretty fun. A couple more slides, and then I'll wrap up, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, a thing that I just want to note, because I, I have a lot of empathy for it, generating good data is really hard. Um, and I was only able to do this because there was already good data that I could start from. And if the data had been bad, the results would have been bad. Garbage in, garbage out. Um, and the example that I always wanted from the very first day, the first meeting I had, and I had so many meetings with the transportation department about this, is I always wanted to be able to say, where's the plow? When's it coming? Has it been? I wanted the snail trail of the plow to exist. In 2007, that wasn't possible because one, not every snow plow in the city had a GPS reader on it. And two, the city tenders out its uh, snowplow contracts to a bunch of different companies. At the time, there were 40 different companies who had responded to that. The city gets the best bid, 
people bid for regions. There's many companies that do the plowing. And so some of them had GPS, but none of them had a common standard. And so it took the city, and I, to their great credit, they did it. It took the city eight years to add into every RFP that then followed that every truck had to have a GPS on it. And that GPS had to meet some common standard that allowed them to then aggregate the feed to be able to give you today one feed of the, G the live GPS tracking for every snowplow, which allowed them in 2017, which is what I'm showing on the wall, which is the city announced that they released the snowplow thing, which is a project that was eight years in the making um, that lots of people were grumpy about that now uh, exists. And I was that day able to go and see where the plow was and when it was coming, uh, which is a thing I'd always wished for. Um, I'd like to have the same thing for my garbage truck with the thing that I regularly miss on Thursday mornings. Um, the other example that I think is really important because this is around the time was 311. And the hope was that 311 would be the great uh, sort of evaluator of civic performance. We would have all this great data. We'd suddenly know everything about how the city and who was the fastest and who was the slowest. And some of that has happened. There was some limited 311 data up there. But the one that we really wanted when I first started uh, at, uh, on open data was MLS data. So municipal, municipal licensing and standards data, the data when uh, an MLS officer gets a call, goes out to the street, maybe gives somebody a ticket because they don't didn't bring their bins back in or because uh, property is derelict or any kinds of the fence issues, all that kind of stuff. Um, turns out at the time, officers who were going out and making those investigations had an iPad, great, we've got data, and we're punching in the information, but it was basically address, open field. I'm oversimplifying, but let's just say that the information about what they were what they were investigating was in the same big open box as Mrs. Jones has a dog and it's a jerk. And the guy who lives next door is whatever. And so any notes that were in there, a lot of PII, a lot of stuff you could never share, but also like this is not a useful data set, right? You need fields and codes and like that was not gonna happen. And nobody's got time to go back and fix that. And so at the time we were like lost to us, never, will never to be seen again. Uh, too bad, would have been nice to know. Um, maybe that's different because the ability for AI to do drudgery and to go back and disambiguate stuff and to train it in order to pull stuff apart and make it useful is a thing we were never gonna pay humans to do, but could totally task AI to do. So maybe there's some really fun opportunities about data we thought was gone that we could have now. And, I, and that's sort of one of my wishes uh, is that we could. This is my ending point, what could we do next? Um, all these images I've generated with um, chat GPT, just giving it weird prompts. Like this was um, uh, a bunch of happy robots celebrating in a park with cyclists nearby. I don't know. Um, anyway, what can we do? So some things that we can do. One, we can share. We can keep sharing. We can build stuff openly. I've talked about the potential for each city to share what it builds. And so don't just make stuff for yourselves, but think about things that we can make for every city that could be reused. I think everybody who's been to a civic tech meetup has wished for this all along. It's not a new idea, but I still wish we did more of it. Um, I also think that organizations like the FCM, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, or AMO, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, if they had money for a couple of developers to do this kind of work, I think they could do something really interesting and useful, especially for small municipalities who are never going to have the staff to do that kind of stuff. I think that's a real gift they could do. They could also unlock stuff that I always wish was unlocked. So when they created 311, they made a Q&A knowledge base for basically like every question you could ask so that an operator, when they got a call at 311, could have an answer that was handy, that was reasonably good. And they update that regularly. That knowledge base is not available as open data. Now there's reasons maybe why it shouldn't because it has phone numbers and important stuff in it, but I wish there was a version of that that was maybe the public version because you could train a really useful chatbot to answer a lot of questions that 311 operators could answer if the knowledge base was tooled up for that and you could constrain it to those answers and it wouldn't give you answers outside of it. And so I've also made this last point. We can go back to old data sets. Uh, so last point, AI can eliminate drudgery. It's one of the things it's the best at is doing stuff nobody wants to do. Um, it's really good at pattern recognition um, and it's tireless in its work. And that to me seems like an opportunity for it to become an augmenter of smart humans who do good work and care deeply about accuracy and civic service. Um, and I think now is a really great opportunity for cities and tech advocates to try it and play with it and refine it and to call out what it fails at and to find ways for it to be better and more accessible. Uh, and for that to be something that civil servants do, that the public does, and that politicians are pursuing for our
our communities. Um, also, it's not always that accurate. I desperately tried to get it to write a headline that says AI saves cities. It cannot spell. Um, and so I just shared that also as an example that AI is far from perfect, still need us, but at its best, it's a really great augmenter of what we are and what we can do. Uh, and so I'm hopeful there will be more. Um, that is the end of my slides. I'm love, love to uh, take questions if you have any or to hear about things you've been working on or are interested in. I'd love to hear from that, especially if you're a person looking for help on a project that you've been working on. Uh, or other bots you all have made, since anybody can do what I did without much effort. Um, I'd love to hear other things folks have been playing with. Um, but yeah, floor is open. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to go and do a round of questions, just a very quick round. Um, and then we're actually going to have breakout rooms. And Ryan was nice enough to offer to stick around for a bit of time. So if we don't get to you in this official Q&A round, there is plenty of opportunity to ask it after if you also stick around. So why don't we ask uh, Douglas and the online group if they have any questions first? Hey, Daniel, I'm, I'm going to be, uh, how do you say it? Luke is going to be taking over. I need to head out uh, shortly. Wait. So um, thanks very much daniel and i do want to thank you Ryan for uh, speaking tonight it was great and thank you douglas for being uh online mc until now um okay. we do have a question in the online chat from uh apologies if i mispronounce your name from manas yeah sorry i'm not sure if my question will be too complicated um and too long to answer so if uh if we have if i short on time i can just leave it to others yeah you're up try to if, if you can keep it simple Let's go. Yeah, for sure. I was wondering if uh, um, uh, AI could be used to um, uh, AI could uh, be used to uh, automate or uh, make easier the process of generating data in the first place, because uh, this seems like more of the user uh, user um, user experience, right? Like uh, the user side of things. But I was wondering if even in generating data, if you can see potential in uh, using AI to make make that easier and faster and more uh, quality. Yeah. I'm just turning my camera on so the folks online have a face to look at instead of just my name. Um, just so I can clarify, the question was using AI to process engineering data in the design process. Is that what I heard or did someone else hear I'm that? sorry, uh, I said generating data in the first place. So for example, if uh, people have, for example, yeah. a lot of data entry operators and so on, if you don't need to hire them and you can get data from raw sources directly somehow and use that to make like make good quality data sets, right? That's what I meant. Yeah. So. I the question is, uh, can it be used for generating data? And so um, I think what I have seen is lots of folks have been using AI to process data and ask it to give it insights about it. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to take a set of notes and to throw it into ChatGPT and ask it to produce summary information and constrain itself to the notes. It can be, it can be quite good at that. I really think the best thing to do though is to treat these tools like a well-meaning intern. It is about that qualified and its work is about that good. And so, like, you would never take the intern's work and publish it without editing it and checking the facts. You should treat this the same way. And so, uh, you know, when um, it's a dark example, but like when the Epstein decision came out about Jeff Epstein, it was 3,500 pages. A bunch of journalists fed that thing into ChatGPT and used it to kind of ask it questions and turn it into essentially an expert witness on the document and to be able to query it without being having to read 3,500 pages, it allowed the reporting on that topic to come out really fast. They still had to go back and make sure that when it said, for example, somebody was in the document, that they actually were. But that's a lot easier to do a find to search for a name than it is to try and like, say, you know, produce that when all the content is in there. So, I think these tools can be used for all useful for all kinds of things. Like I, I'm here saying I think we're going to be able to use them for drug discovery. That's what I do for a living right now. Uh, and so I think there's lots of stuff. There also isn't like one AI. Let's be really clear. Like there are many, many different kinds of tools and chat GPT and large language models is just one example from one company. Uh, there are competing LLMs and their LLMs are used for all kinds of different things. And using an LLM, a large language model is only one type of AI or machine learning or, or approach. So. Um, long answer to your question, but the short answer is yes, but be careful and check your data. Yeah, thank you. That was really helpful. Yeah. So you're basically concerned about reliability, right? Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, let's take one question from the, the room. Ben, you were 
one second. <laughs> so I was wondering what you thought of the balance between doing basic stuff well and using new technology like you've been demonstrating here. So for this example, it's found this like perfect schedule where both of your kids can take swim classes at the same time. You still have to use eFund to register your kids for that program, and that's going to suck. So for governments thinking about how do we be better at tech, like how do you balance like, okay, we should be able to have our people pay you without calling you for your credit card versus like, here's a thing where we can take our data and like make a lot out of it. Um, I agree with you. Now we're getting into like my opinion on how governments should do IT policy, but I would say um, there are a lot of ways where governments with limited capacity can serve citizens better with stuff that's low and easy lift. And I think if there are things like that, we should do it. Um, do I think I should be able and should have been able for many years to pay for transit with my phone? Like, yes. And was it hard to, to build and is the technology like available and expensive or whatever? Yes. So like, I wish the government did the hard things. I wish they were resourced to do the hard things. And I, I wish they would tackle that stuff. I wish they didn't have to stand in line with like two phones running on like Parks and Rec, Camp Rec, rec uh, Recommendation Day. Just in part so I don't have to listen to the 30 other neighbors of mine who are also grumpy about it. Like, I wish we could solve those things. So that's been like part of the holy grail of like solving access to civic services for a long time. But part of me thinks that if you do the easy stuff Maybe you can let, take the load off of other things and maybe that creates space uh, to do some of those. I think as long as you balance that with counterbalance of like, there are hard things that are really important that we should focus on, things like accessibility. Um, and some of those things might have to jump the line over some of the easy things because they're important if you want to include everything. So I think there's always a balance there. There's no one. That's right. 